vision received was that of blood cells traveling throughout the body, supplying the much needed oxygen and other nutrients to the differing members of the body to fulfill their purpose. Once the blood cells are spent, they must return back to the heart to be refilled before being sent out again and fulfill their purpose. Well, my words um, or my thoughts on the matter, um, they stem from the scriptures, but they also stem from experience. I can't, I can't ignore and neglect uh, experiences that I've had, and I'm pretty sure that my wife... Um, we haven't had, obviously, the same experiences, but they've been so similar that it's caused us to do things in our, in our family in order to protect them. So mm -hmm. we both have had, um, before meeting each other, before you know, ever getting married, previous um, sexual experiences that made a, a, a clear and definitive impact on us that steered us in a direction that the enemy wanted us to go into. Um, I wasn't a Christian at the time, but, you know, I've testified on, on previous podcasts that I, I had gone to Christian schools all my life. I considered myself a Christian. Um, and during the 80s, <clears throat> it became very popular to make a covenant that you were going to keep yourself Mm -hmm. pure mm -hmm. before you get married you were not going to have those relationships and i was in christian schools i remember either hearing it at, at, at different things probably saw it on tv uh and i remember vowing in my heart with the lord i'm never going to do that i am going to remain faithful or whatever and i promised him i promised the lord that i would I ended up doing it and it was through naivety it was through weakness it was through um you know the, the person that gave us the, all of these topics um they have this idea that they can sleep like be in bed and sleep with a person <laughs> and i don't mean sleep sexually just sleep with them mm -hmm. And that that's okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And me being nearly a half a century uh, alive, look back and think, that is the most naive, most gullible, most <laughs> ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But if I was in their position, I said the same thing. I said, I would not cross this line. Told the person I was with, not crossing this line. I promised the Lord. And yet, I found myself doing what they think they can do and not fall. And, and it was just, it was really one of the most foolish things I've ever done. And then on top of that, we've, ha we've had inappropriate sexual experiences. Or, or close to sexual experiences of like sexual abuse and, and stuff like that. And we brought that into our marriage having known that and we were very, very adamant. We don't, we want to protect our children from that because we understood that if they were to be exposed to something at a very young age, that that could jettison them off into a direction that the Lord did not want for them. So we were, we tried to be very vigilant about not allowing any type of uh, uh, sex on TV, sex on the movies, uh, internet, tried to lock this internet down <laughs> when they got into their adolescence, what a battle that was. I don't really want to talk about it, but you know, we tried our best to do all these things. And if we saw a movie that was getting to a point, we would either fast forward it or just shut off the movie. You know, and obviously we weren't watching it with the kids at the time. But even as I got, got older, if there was a certain point where like, oh, we know where this is going forward, and we just skip it. And we just skip to, okay, they're talking again. Okay, and they got their clothes on. Okay. And so we move on. Um, so we always tried to do that because we understood the, I mean, we said music has, has a powerful, powerful influence. Sex is extremely powerful in the life of an individual. Um, 
And so knowing that because of all the years of experience, it's very hard for, which is why I wanted you two to talk and, 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 and share on this podcast because, you know, when you're near a half a century, kids your age don't really want to listen to people because you're too old. You don't know what it's like, blah, 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 blah. You hear all the excuses. You have realized that there's nothing new under the sun. All of the sexual temptations you guys are having, we had them. We've been through it. We, but we now are wiser about it and we can now, you know, feed into you. And so I wanted to hear from a younger couple that, and I'm so, I, I want to, I want to tell you how much I appreciate your honesty. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and sharing what you what you just said because you, we've said it a couple times. Nobody talked to us about this. Mm -hmm. like, that's why I asked you. Did you get that in yourself? Did your parents? No, nobody talked. Yeah, I went through the same thing. Nobody talked to me about this, and it, it was hard to find anybody to try to talk uh, uh, about all of this. So, I've got a lot to say about you know. You kind of merged the two together, so I want to hit the dating and the. And, dating uh, situation. Um, as I've looked at it, dating is not biblical. I look in the scriptures and I don't see any examples of dating in the scriptures <laughs> like the dating that we see today. So let me, let me preface that or qualify that statement. We don't see dating like we do today in the Bible at all. To me, today's dating is a facade. It's a counterfeit of marriage. Dating gives the idea that this person, she's my girl. Or for the girl, that's my man. As if they were some sort of property. Some sort of like, I own them and they own me. No, you guys aren't even married. What are you talking about? Boyfriends and girlfriends, they didn't exist like they do today in the scriptures. And so today's dating, for the most part, and you brought it up about commitment. For me, it's a quasi-commitment. It's not really a commitment. You're a boyfriend. She's a girlfriend. You're not allowed to talk to other girls and he's not allowed to talk to or she's not allowed to talk to other guys. See what I'm saying? There's this exclusivity of, of each other. You, as your relationship grows in, in today's dating, you, you play with the hands. You know, we in Spanish say, no, oye, oye no se juega de mano. Oh, Eso yeah. no se hace. <laughs> para, para. You know, we say that in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, then there's tickling, mm -mm. you know, and tickling. <laughs> uh, in today's day, now, don't think of yourselves. Just think generally, stereotypically, worldly dating has all of these things. You hold hands. No one's allowed to hold their hand. No one but you. Arm around the shoulder. Arm on his waist. Touching his love handles. Caressing his love handle. Uh, you might lie with your head down on their lap. Uh, she may sit on your lap. You got your first kiss. Then there's kissing. This is all the evolving of the dating scene in today's world. And then you get hickeys. You try to hide those. And the next thing you know, the hands are, are, are caressing certain areas where they should not be. And, you know, you get your typical back of the car, steamy windows, because you're not going to go home with your parents or anything like that. And you're alone with each other. No one else is around. What do you think is going to happen? Mm. And what does that end up with? You, you, you mentioned it. You're adults shacking together. That's usually what that type of dating scenes. Because if you're in it long enough after that two year period. Why does a man need to commit to a marriage? I'm getting everything I want right now. Mm -hmm. We're living together. Uh, she's cleaning my ba my bathroom. Mm -hmm. She's cleaning my house. She you know, she's she's got a job. I've got a job. You know, I've got everything I need. What do I need to get married for? Why do I need to sign the dotted line? And so many men are fearful of that's going to change everything. That's going to change everything. The marriage is going to change it all. No, 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 no. This is good. We got, we got it good. Don't you, aren't you happy? I'm happy. You happy? You know, and, and, mm -hmm. and so they talk themselves into it, into this thing. And the dating of the world leads godly men and women, mm -hmm. godly men and women down a path where so many before them have failed and have fallen. Mm -hmm. So many, so many. 
And it is this dating that the enemy uses to delay Mm -hmm. and sometimes abort the fulfillment and the calling of God in that godly man or woman's life, that godly child of God. It puts the children of God, today's dating scene puts the children of God at risk and regular unnecessary duress of temptation. Mm -hmm. Why? Why put yourself daily through that Constantly being tempted every time you're around your your partner or they're around you to then sin. And so if you engage in this type of dating, you you inevitably will mar the image of Christ, both in yourself and in them. And in a prospective female's faith walk, when you dishonor her with these behaviors and actions before marriage, um it's not like you can't be redeemed. It's not like you can't um, be saved or delivered from that. But there's got to be extreme repentance on your part if that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Extreme repentance. Mm-hmm. And so the scripture you brought up earlier about Jeremiah seventeen nine that the heart is deceitful above all things. And most of the time in the dating scene, it's the heart of the individual that is leading them to do these things. Now, for the, I will clarify this. For the person that is born again, I don't believe that the heart is desperately sick. Mm -hmm. I believe it's born again. Mm -hmm. It's a new creature in Christ. But if they don't have, and mostly time people in the dating scene, especially young youth, do not have the temperedness, the Mm self-control to let themselves be led of the spirit. They're not mature enough to do that. And so they end up, not because their heart is desperately sick, but because they're flesh, they don't have control over it. They end up falling in that way for, for a separate reason. So I think that the scriptures have redefined um, dating for the godly man, and I mean man generically, for the godly man and woman. From, our, from my experience and from what I've read in the scriptures, trying to apply principles, principles. If we're going to date, It should be with the idea that I'm really just collecting data right now. Mm. It's very logical. It's very rational. It's very manly. Mm. We think this way. I'm collecting data. I'm collecting information on you, on you, and you, and you. And, 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 you know, if I see you that, that you're prim, you're proper, you, you like to dress well, or, or, or you're, you're putting yourself, you're flaunting yourself on Instagram with your bikini and you're showing yourself out. I'm collecting all of that data. You may look fine. You may look gorgeous. But if I'm the godly man or woman, I'm looking at that and say, flag, red flag, red flag, red flag. Oh, that's okay. Good. And and I'm collecting all this data because I want to figure out what type of woman or what type of man do I want, depending on your sex, okay? Um, And and there's no need for quasi-commitments during that stage. Mm -hmm. It's just you getting to know people, getting to know what people are like, getting to know, oh my God, there's so many myriad personalities in this world. I just need to get to know that, 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 oh, there's this type of person and there's that. I mean, sometimes we compartmentalize them in this group and this group and, you know, you have your four types of personalities and all that. But even there, there's still nuances within those groups. So you, you, you just really have to get to know people in general. I think a general open friendship should be very, very important. And then what does it do? If, if, if it's right, if, if it, you know, if, if all the checks are, are being checkmarked, all the boxes are being checked, then it leads to courtship. Mm-hmm. But the dating wasn't a quasi commitment. The dating was just you being friends. Why can't you? In today's day and age, it's almost like you can't be friends with people. You have to be tied to somebody. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, you don't. And I have to keep telling some, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, my own children, it's okay to be friends with people. You don't have to be committed to that one person. Get to know the lot of them. And when I say get to know them, I'm just saying be friends. Mm -hmm. There's no sexual, you're not crossing any sexual lines with anybody. And then if that courtship passes that test, you lead to, and you continue marriage. Mm -hmm. You can, you conclude that, that stage, but then you continue your relationship in marriage. And so that's wisdom. Wisdom if it's the principal thing, then we should follow it accordingly. So friendship is when two or more people, they walk together in agreement and accountability. If I'm friends with someone, 
It's because, you know, we agree on, on, on a lot of things, a good amount of things, but we are also holding each other accountable. That's why we're friends, because we can do that. There's an honesty, a genuineness in our friendship. And so we're learning and we're growing together as individuals and in the community of our friends and they're seeing it. And if it's, you know, if we're doing it in the church and, and we're, we seem to be closer than other people might be, everyone in the church is holding us accountable. They're watching what we're doing. They're watching what we're saying and, and how we're at, you know, with each other. And that's all a good thing because if it's of God, you want people watching you. You want, you want people to say, hey, watch that. You know, you know, my, my wife had to, had to say something recently, uh, and I, I won't mention any names, you know, but they were going away and they were going to stay in a hotel and they were going on a vacation. They weren't married. Oh, yo, you playing with fire there, girl. No, she didn't say that. That's what I would have said. I said, girl, you playing with fire. What are you doing? You know, more than fire. Yeah. yeah. You know, so. We have to, in the, in the body of Christ, we have to hold each other accountable that way because it's not about, I, I want to tell you what to do. That's the last thing I want to tell anybody what to do. But if I love you enough, then I'm going to put aside the fact that you may feel offended when I say this, but hey, I think you need to reconsider that. And there's a way to say that so that you're not, you know, coming directly out there and offending. And that's sometimes kind of hard for me. I'm, I'm not the type of person I'll to beat around him. the bush, you know. I, I try to, and it, I just, just seem to fail. It. I just oh, it's about a relationship say, with yeah. the person. Yeah, yeah. yeah it depends on your relationship with the just person. Yeah, the band aid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So courtship then follows as the next level of commitment, or it should, and and that's where that in that courtship now now you're exclusively with each other. It's, co- it's sort of like you know before Mary got Mary got married to Joseph, they were engaged. That's that courtship part. They weren't going to hang out with anybody else. They weren't going to have any other relationship. And some of those friends that they had, you know, they kind of stopped talking with them as much because now they're kind of moving more toward that commitment. And so when you enter into that level of relationship where you're, where it's courtship and you're, you're kind of moving in the direction where you're one another's exclusively. And I have to say this without the disallowed benefits found only in marriage. In other words, without the prohibition Mm -hmm. of things that are only applied to marriage. Mm -hmm. If you engage in those disallowed benefits that are found only in marriage, then you're running the risk of defiling and corrupting what once initially began as a holy endeavor. And so this level turns both parties consciously, both parties are consciously moving toward the agreed upon goal of a lifelong commitment in their marriage. And so this lays a foundation of that mutual commitment. You're preparing life together now, kind of preliminarily. Um, after the c- ceremony of the covenant of marriage is made before all men, and then you just continue in that same, this is where we're going, you know. So marriage is the means to the end. And what's the end? That you both together as one flesh are fulfilling God's purpose. Mm-hmm. And so I found out, which is right before I met my wife, because I had it, I had a, a girlfriend at the time, um, struggled for three years trying to get this relationship to work. And because th- she was supposedly also in the kingdom, you know, she was a child of God and I felt like I was a child of God. Um, but our directions were always so far apart. And then we were dealing with the temptations of the carnality because we were, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend. I realized that you can be unequally yoked and both be in the kingdom. And I just learned that by experience. I I thought that was, you know, that's, you know, those are outside the kingdom and those that are inside. I thought that only applied there, but I realized, no, it applies there and it can apply within the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's the thing. There's nothing wrong if God is calling you in this direction to fulfill his will and he's calling this other person in that direction to fulfill God's will, then go. Mm -hmm. But don't try to do it together because you're going to end up you know, conflicting with what God wants. So I've got some guidelines since, since we're trying to, to help out our young folk. Um, so I want you to think about these things. And it's kind of like what I, what I talked about, the piercing and the tattoos. I'm going to give you questions and I'm going to ask you to think about these things. Is your potential spouse or member of the same family? 
And what I mean by that is the family of God. Oh, gosh. That was so <laughs> You got to start there. That was almost No, no, no. Right. You got to start there. There's too many of our beloved uh, brothers and sisters that are young that want a relationship so bad that they're willing to consider someone that is not even in the family of God. I thought you were talking about incest. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we're all... No. Um, I was... So... (laughs) Same I'm good. I got your attention. That's good. (laughs) So, like-minded folks usually fare better together. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was a song in in 1989, Opposites Attract, by Paula Abdul. I remember that. Opposites Attract. And... You, 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 usually you have to be on the same page on a lot of things. Do you have common interests? Do you have common values? Do you agree on the essentials of living day-to-day goals in life, basic life issues? Do you enjoy just similar things together? You know, uh, I, well, in our relationship early on, I was, I was avidly into sports. Um, and, and in order to get over that, she wasn't really into sports. But in order to get over that, uh, there was a time where I would come home and like after church, I'd watch football and she'd be sleeping on my lap. She wasn't enjoying it with me. I got to have my football. She got to have a rest after. No, it wasn't about you being pregnant. It was about you weren't really into the, to, to the sports and that's fine. We found a way to, to uh, accommodate uh, that in each other. So it is said, now let me ask the women before you leave. Is it true that women fall in love and get married? Or what? And men decide to get married and then look for a wife. Why? Is that a true statement? That women fall in love and get married, but men, on the other hand, decide to get married and then they begin looking for a wife. Well, it's biblical because it says a man who finds a wife finds mm-hmm. a good thing. So the man part. I'm not sure about the woman not part. Not sure about the woman part. I don't okay. know if I want to agree with that. Wait, say the woman one again. again. It is said that women, it is said, it's just a saying, it is women. It is said that women fall in love and then they get married. But men don't do that. They decide, I want to get married, and then they begin to go looking for a wife. It's just a saying. I'm not with it. What do you think? Is that true? That's not a one size fit at all. I don't okay. Think. Yeah. All right. So it's just a saying. We're going to leave it at that. But the, the thing that is clear is Proverbs, and you brought it up 1822 before. Whoso findeth a good wife, findeth, wife, findeth, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor from the Lord. Mm-hmm. So, number two, most scriptures show men seeking after their spouse Isaac, Samson, Jacob. I could probably string out some more. Women generally did not search out for their husband. Generally. I can't, I can't even think of one right now. I, I can think of one because <laughs> I was just reading in uh, Genesis. Um, there was a particular woman that um, she was married to one of Judah's sons. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he died. Oh. Yeah, and he said, listen, when my younger son grows up, I'm going to give him over to you so that you can continue to see. He didn't, he didn't, uh, fulfill that. Mm-hmm. He kind of, uh, forgot, not forgot about her. He, he knew about her, but he just didn't do it for whatever reason. It didn't tell us the re- real reason why, but she then acted like a harlot. And got with Judah, Mm -hmm. the father of, oh gosh, what what an interesting story that was. Mm -hmm. But that's the only time I can think of a woman was actively seeking out their husband. All the other examples that I gave you about Isaac and and Samson, they were always looking for their wife, looking for their wife, seeking for their wife. So when I think about that, when you find a prospective candidate, I think it's incumbent upon the man to seek her out, to go after her. And, and the principle that I, that I think would apply to that, do you remember uh, the parable of the kingdom of heaven as like a treasure hidden in a field? Mm-hmm. When you find that treasure, you sell everything. Mm-hmm. You get after it. And I think that, 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 that could be applied to this idea. It also says that Jesus, um, that we loved him, Why? 
Because he first loved us. He first showed his love toward us. He had his eye on us and he let us know it. And that's why we then reciprocated that love. So in that same manner that Jesus first loved us, we should be sharing our love to that potential spouse first, letting them know they shouldn't have to be waiting. <laughs> you know, we've known some saints that, you know, the, the, the prospective wife that wife actually came to be was just like, hey, it's been a few years already and he ain't said anything. He ain't asked me anything. I think I'm going to be going back to my home state. You know, she, she lives somewhere else and we're like, no, relax, dude, wait. Cause we already knew the other, the other, the other person. And we already knew that, you know, they had plans that just, just, they were just waiting for the right appropriate time. It's not that they were delaying her <laughs> and just making her wait and, and stringing her along. Cause that, they, there are some men that do that. They just string them along, you know, and they, they keep the, you know, that illegitimate relationship going. So I would also think that if you're considering on getting married, that you should have in the present moment that you're in, you should have the means to take care of yourself and your wife. Mm -hmm. I think that's incumbent upon the man that he should be situated where if he's going to get married, he should be ready to take on that added responsibility. He should. And if he's not ready for that, then maybe he needs to hold up. But Jesus is the standard to me of that. He's not going to go and, and get married when he's not prepared, when he doesn't have everything ready. No, no. He's got everything ready. Now he's going to go and bring her in. So... Another thing that, you know, as we're data collecting, as I said before, you want to kind of pay attention to the friends of that particular person that you're interested in, because whether they like it or not, they kind of indicate something about that person that you're interested in. Uh, sometimes they reflect positively on that person. Sometimes they reflect negatively on that person. Um, and sometimes they accurately identify the type of person that that person really is because if he likes hanging out with that person that's always drinking or always smoking or always cussing and and he doesn't have a problem with that that may be an issue you know you you need to think about that so and then how about your perspective mate you should be doing the same thing on the other um if you're interested in a relationship with someone and you wanted to make it more seriously you should be looking at well how does that person treat their mother if you're the woman how does that person treat their mother What's their relationship like? How does, she, how does he treat her openly? How does uh, he value her deep inside of his heart? Are there any unresolved issues between him and his mom? Because like it or not, I, I've seen this many times. You tend to bring in those issues into your relationship and your marriage if you have an issue with your mom. And the same thing the other way. If, if the, the, the what prospective wife has an issue with her father and they have contention and, and maybe they don't see eye to eye. Maybe she's been rebelliously under his covering. She may bring that right into your relationship with you and not want to, you know, come underneath you uh, in, in that respect. So again, all of this I'm treating as if I'm not talking to the world. I'm talking to our brothers and sisters in the church. Um, your family, the family of the individual tends to communicate to your future wife what she may expect of you as you grow up and mature in your family together. Sometimes this, the family dynamics of your spouse and how they relate to each other, if they were raised in that and that's what they know, they're probably going to expect that that's the way your yeah, relationship, whether good or bad, sometimes, I mean, hopefully it's good, but maybe, you know, there's expectations that, you know, their father always did this for their mother and they're the, 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 the wife, they might tend to expect that that's going to be the same way it's going to be done. And maybe you're not like that. And it's not, that it's a bad thing. It's just, you're just not like that. It's a different personality. It's a different person, but she may come into it, that relationship with those uh, expectations. Expectations is a is a could be a very positive thing, but also be a very hurtful thing. And her family will do the same. I think another question that you guys need to ask is before you you make your commitments, do you know what your calling is in life? Because mm -hmm. if you don't know what you're called to do, called to be, you may not be ready. Because then taking on the responsibility of a relationship and carrying that. Sometimes that gets in the way of you figuring out what does God want of me, me, 
I'm alone individually important to God in some manner or respect, and I need to know what that is first. And once I know what that is, then when I meet my prospective spouse, if you're the man, just like I said with my wife, I prayed one month prior to ever meeting her, um, the things that I wanted in, in a virtuous woman. But one of those things was, because I got sick and tired of the, 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 uh, the naivety in, 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 in the uh, uh, relationships, um, I wanted someone that was going to come alongside me and wherever God was calling me to. Because I said one was going this way, one was going that way, and I was sick and tired of that. I felt like I was just being pulled apart. I wanted to follow after God, and this relationship was pulling me in a different direction. Not that she didn't want me to follow after God. I just felt torn, and I didn't want that. So I want, I wanted my spouse to come alongside me wherever I'm going. And I think as a man, they should all expect that. Because the, the visions and the calling should be compatible. That's why I said if they're not compatible, she's a great woman of God, but she may not be yours, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, for you. And you need to consider that. No matter how much your flesh is like, man, I think she's so pretty. She's so beautiful. And you're like, that's not all there is. Um, do you have a vision? Do you have a direction that you're firmly headed towards? And then how about your perspective mate? Does, do they have a vision or perspective that they're heading towards? You're, and, and I think men should remember that your wife should become your help in order to feel God's calling on your life. And if your callings are not compatible, that you may end up aborting both of what God wants in your life and in their life, just because you want your flesh now involved in it. You know, I, I want to be satisfied with that person. You should also think about, this is my number eight. You should also think about, do you recognize patterns in your life? Maybe repeated cycles, mood swings, broken relationships. How, do you see those patterns in your perspective mate? Now, you just told us you don't have any relationships. You, that's not too much to worry about. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think generally speaking, most people have had a relationship of some kind beforehand. And uh, if it's been multiple relationships, why is there so many broken relationships? Why have you had five boyfriends? Why have you had six girlfriends? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? um, are you ready personally? If you're the man, this is, uh, I was gearing this for the man. Are you ready personally to be the priest and leader in your home? Because if you're not, you shouldn't be thinking about marriage right now. You need to be firmly grounded in Christ. You need to know who you are in him. And can your prospective spouse complement and enhance the talents and gifts God has given you? Can you also do the same for her? They've got to be compatible. Can you envision working together as a team to fulfill the will of God? For you, do your hearts beat for mutual causes? That was one thing we, you know, we found out a lot in, in our commonalities and interests. We, we seem to have the same spiritual perspective of principles, uh, of things that, that were just foundational, that helped us be able to endure and weather all the storms that, that we have uh, weathered over the years. Um, think about number 11. This is before the, uh, the last one. Does pursuing your relationship with this person change who God has made you to be mm -hmm. and the direction he's taking you? In? Are you feeling pressure to perform in order to maintain this relationship? And are you putting pressure on them to conform in your time rather than God's time? Maybe she's not ready. And then my last one is, do you understand as a man that you represent Christ to her? And you mentioned that earlier. Mm -hmm. that's, it's, that's vitally important to be understood. Kind of like a father represents God the Father to his children, the husband represents Christ unto the wife, the bride of Christ. And so your relationship should, like Jesus' relationship individually, leads us into a deeper, deeper, more intimate relationship with him. Our natural relationship with life should lead them into a deeper, more intimate relationship and richer relationship with Christ and not deter it. And many times you, and I speak to both, both now, the husband and the wife, each other will be God's tangible, natural instrument for them to inter interact and relate more personally with Jesus. That's actually what's going to happen. And so I ended it with, you know, God himself calculated the worth of your love and decided that it was worth his own life. So in sacrificing himself for you, he pledges to love you throughout all eternity. Jesus set that example in paying the ransom for his bride. 
So now I speak as a, as as the prospective wife. Well, shouldn't you, the child of God, should you, shouldn't you be expecting that from your husband? That's exactly what you should be expecting from your husband. That she would be just like Jesus. That she that he would sacrifice everything for you. But at the same time, the man of God, are you ready to pay that price? Mm-hmm. If you go into a relationship and a marriage, you better count the cost. You. You want to build a house, you you count the cost, find out if you have the resources, find out if you have, you know, the building material, find out if you have the the, the money for this, find out all the things you need to find out and then make a decision. It it can't be just, I forgot it was either you or or Victor Lauda said that love is not a, uh, uh, an emotion, it's a choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's an intentionality. And I think you spoke about it, but you didn't words the intentionality, but there's an intentionality that has to be behind this it's not just oh i fell in love it was just so romantic and, <laughs> no yes, no that that that's a fantasy we drum up in our mind it gives us the butterflies and all of that stuff but when you're married for 20 plus years you realize that that fantasy left like a long time ago and everything else was the foundation that mm-hmm. was laid that's going to stand the test of time that's going to stand all of the weathers and the trials and the tribulations and all that so that's what I had to say about dating. Yes, go ahead. I, I stepped away. So did mm-hmm. you address that something that I tell all my girlfriends when they're talking about prospective mm. husbands and stuff is, are you ready to follow him? Because mm-hmm. um, there is no if, ands, or buts. We as women are supposed to submit to our husbands. They're the ones leading the charge, and we're supposed to be following. Not to say that God doesn't say there's mutual... Um, account, uh, mutual submission because he does say submit yourselves one to another but the role uh, that I always ask my friends is if that's not the person that you can follow then you don't need you don't need to be considering that relationship Yeah, as you're supposed to submit yeah I'd, uh, you, you said it in a different ways it. but I did mention Yeah, they, they both have to be ready to fulfill their obligations and responsibilities and of the and divine covenant. It has to be a man of yeah. God. There's no offense of us about that either. Thus is the ministry of our Father's heart through us. Our utmost desire is to be in the Father's heart, to know the Father's heart, and express the Father's heart to you. If you appreciate listening to this podcast and we're blessed, Pass it along to someone else by text, email, or word of mouth in the hopes that they might be positively impacted as you were. If you are interested in supporting our efforts, we would ask you to consider the following. One, pray for us. Two, leave a positive rating or review with whomever you listen to our podcast with. And three, if you desire to contribute monetarily, you can do so at paypal.me slash jbenjesus or cash app dollar sign J Ben Jesus or Venmo J Ben Jesus that's J B E N J E S U S God bless